All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Unit 3 guided lecture um, for AP Euro. So um, a lot to get to um, in this one. So we're really focusing on the the two concepts of absolutism and constitutionalism. There's a lot of political developments in this unit. They also touch on some economic developments as well, which we'll get to at the end of this guided lecture. Um, but it's it's mostly a political unit. There's very little social. There's very little cultural. We're really focused on um, the development of political systems after the, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Um, so it says Europe's political world in the 16th through the 18th centuries typo there, sorry. Um, but really, we're going to be focusing on mostly the 17th century and, and uh, a little bit into the 18th century. But um, yeah, so that's that. So um, <clears throat> so a little bit of context here. So when we look at this time period, we always want to go back a little bit and, and set the stage. So we have the, the religious wars coming out of the Protestant Reformation, the biggest one being the Thirty Years' War which is 1618 to 1648. Um, and there's a lot of other crises that are going on um, in Europe. So we have agricultural dec decline. We have rampant poverty among the lower classes and the peasants. We have um, a crisis that is related to this for the peasants because they've been fighting these wars for um, a very long time, over 100 years. Um, and they have this poverty, the recurrence of the plague. So there's disease as well. And so what we have is a lot of instability. When we look at the situation in Europe politically and socially, as well as economically, but really politically and socially throughout the 16th and the first half of the 17th centuries, we just have massive amounts of instability. And the Thirty Years' War is really that breaking point. That's the point where the European states start to say, well, well look, we, we need a solution to this. These, these wars of reformation have been going on for over 100 years. Um, we've been dealing with peasant revolts and peasant uprisings. There, there has to be something that, that uh, fixes this. Um, for us, us meaning the European state system. And at the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, this, this idea of state sovereignty really comes out of the Peace of Westphalia, basically, that every ruler, every state, every monarch, every government, whatever it, it may be, has sovereignty, has the right to rule itself. And so these wars of religion have to stop based on the idea of state sovereignty. Now, as we're going to see, this does not mean that, that wars just cease. There are going to be wars for expansion throughout the late 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. Um, but the notion that um, monarchs who are sitting or, or governments who are ruling have sovereignty, have le the legitimate authority to rule over their borders is... Um, is revolutionary. This is something that had been in the workings, um, Peace of Augsburg in, in 1555, for example, but the Peace of Westphalia is really what cements it. Um, and this is also going to lead to the, the, um, the quest for a balance of power, which is one of the central tenets that's going to guide European diplomacy really up until the French Revolution. Um, and Napoleon kind of um, throws that into chaos again. I and mean, then we'll get the Congress of Vienna in 1815, which is an attempt to restore this balance of power. So for the next, really up until World War I, honestly, the focus on the balance of power and maintaining the balance of power, coupled with state sovereignty, are these, these two crucial, crucial um, underpinnings of European um, diplomacy. So when we actually drill into the, the solutions to these problems, what we see is that European states are going to develop along two fairly different paths. They're going to have some similarities, but they're they're pretty different. Um, and you you all should be familiar with these constitutionalism and absolutism. So the first one we're going to take a look at is absolutism because this is really the first one to to develop. Um, but but these these political ideologies do develop along um, parallel tracks. They're developing at the same time. So constitutionalism in England is going to be like a late 17th century thing. The Dutch with constitutionalism is actually going to be like an early to mid 17th century thing. Um, whereas when we see absolutism, that's that's very much the same time period. Um, Spain, France, Russia, um, Austria, there's a lot of examples of absolutism in Europe during the, uh, the, the late 17th and, and 18th centuries. So these are the two paths, and you should absolutely know the countries that are going to be following um, following these paths, and we're gonna we're gonna get into them um, as we go through. So, College Board does kind of a weird thing, in my opinion. They sort of separate out the Enlightenment into Unit 
um, four into the next unit. So in some ways, understanding the political developments of Europe during this time is really challenging because we don't have the, the philosophical developments that are also going along with these political developments that are justifying these political developments. So I just want to give you two up front. If you think back to world history your freshman year, both of these people who I'm going to talk about should have appeared um, in either AP World or um, World Honors, if you took either of those classes. Um, Thomas Hobbes, who's a mid-17th century um, a political philosopher, English, he, he basically believes that the state of human nature is, is war, um, that man, um, mankind, air quotes around that, is brutish, is nasty, is competitive, and so what needs to happen in order to control these urges, these these base urges of human nature is absolutism. So um, people agree to give up some of their rights to live under an absolute ruler, but the absolute ruler then protects people from their own innate, terrible urges. Um, that's what Hobbes says. He, he says this in his most famous treatise, which is Leviathan, um, published in 1651. I think, mid-17th century. Now, the counter to Hobbes is going to come a little bit later, um, late 17th century, which is John Locke. John Locke basically says that he, human nature is, um, is not brutish and nasty, but that humans are um, a blank slate, tabula rasa. They are, they are to be written upon by society. So um, their human nature is not, in fact, um, defined at birth, as Hobbes would say. And so because of that, what Hobbes believes is that um, if, a, if a society is crafted that is orderly, um, that, uh, that protects people's rights, that absolutism is not necessary. Um, and so we can have something like constitutionalism. Locke also basically says that um, there's this social contract that exists between the people and the ruler, whereas Hobbes would say absolutism is just the way that it has to be, and sometimes you get good rulers and sometimes you get bad rulers. Locke says, no, 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 because of, because of um, the, the nature of mankind, that the social contract can actually be broken by both sides. It can be broken by the people, but it can also be broken by the rulers. And so if it is broken by the rulers, there is the right of the people to revolt. Um, John Locke, very, very influential thinker for um, the Glorious Revolution, which is going to be happening around the time that he's writing these things. Um, but of course, revolutions to come. Um, the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution, John Locke, really, really influential there. So we have these two divergent thinkers, and they're going to relate to our two, two divergent paths as well. So you should be thinking about, like, what is human nature? And again, this is kind of difficult because we haven't, we haven't um, dove into the Enlightenment yet, but hopefully you remember some of that from, from ninth grade. So we'll cover absolutism first, and then we'll talk about um, constitutionalism second. Okay. So absolutism, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because my hope is that you remember a lot of this. So absolutism, it's right in the name of the term. The ruler has absolute power and absolute authority. Cardinal Richelieu, who is pictured over here to the left, is one of the architects of absolutism, certainly one of the architects of absolutism in France. Um, Richelieu is going to be um, one of the most important state ministers of Louis XIII, um, and he believes in creating a state based on the reason of the state, raison d'etre. I said that completely wrong. Um, I took German, so my French is rough. Um, this is like, uh, the reason is because of the state, and the state is the reason. So why are things done? Why are laws passed? Um, they are passed because that is what the absolute ruler decrees. Uh, s simple as that. Now, why is absolutism created? Why do people like Richelieu and others believe that absolutism is the way to go? Because they believe that absolute authority, when it is imbued into a, a monarch, will result in st security and stability. So there are three threats that Richelieu sees um, in France 
during the early 17th century. Richelieu is um, a cardinal and a state minister in the early 17th century in France. Um, and that is the nobility, these religious divisions, and the constant warfare um, related to them, and powerful local governors. And so Richelieu's goal, and later the absolute monarch's goal, is going to be to eliminate all three, to consolidate power in the absolute monarchy uh, so that um, there are no factions, there is no division of power and authority, but in fact, authority is centralized. And so what we see um, is that when we have large problems, which most European rulers would agree in the early 17th century, there are large problems. And so the solution is large government. And so what do you need um, for a large government? Well, you need a large army, you need a large standing army. This is also going to help with putting down these frequent wars, um, but a large army is going to help this large government enforce its authority over um, large areas, the country. Larger armies is going to lead to larger bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is just the, um, the, the government officials that exist under the absolute monarch, in this case, under the authority, who are going to carry out the laws and the orders. So that's what bureaucracy is. And you guys have probably heard the term before, bureaucrats. Bureaucrats are those government officials who are going to be executing the laws, carrying out the laws. And so um, power is going to be centered in these absolute rulers. Another term from world history, which hopefully you remember, is divine right. This is what's really going to be important to absolutism. This notion that these rulers are ordained by God to rule over their countries. And so absolutism has a lot going for it in terms of justification. Um, despite the fact that there are not a lot of rights for the average people, um, for peasants, or even for the nobility, a lot of people are going to accept absolute rule because it leads to fewer wars. It leads to um, a more efficient state. And so it's going to solve a lot of these problems that existed in early to mid 17th century Europe. Um, we talk about this tension often in history, the tension between security and freedom. When there is a lack of security, people are more willing to give up their freedoms. And um, especially if we were to go back to early 17th century Europe, people had very few freedoms to begin with. And so this is fertile ground for something like um, absolutism to take root. The model absolute ruler is, of course, Louis XIV. Louis XIV is a model absolute ruler for a number of reasons. He rules for a very long time. He rules, um, he takes over right on the coattails of Cardinal Richelieu's death. So Richelieu has spent a long time writing about the legitimacy of absolutism and consolidating power around Louis the Thirteenth. Um, Louis the Thirteenth dies, I think, a year after Richelieu, um, and so you have this transition right into Louis the Fourteenth, who is going to be a ruler at a very young age. Um, he's going to be mentored by Cardinal Mazarin, who himself was a disciple of Cardinal Richelieu. So Louis is raised to believe that absolutism is natural and right. Louis is also believed to raise that he is ordained by God and was put on the throne to be an absolute ruler. So there's a lot of factors that are coming together here to make Louis such a powerful ruler and such a great representation of absolutism for us. Um, Louis spends lavishly. Louis um, uses art to glorify his reign. There is no better representation in terms of architecture of absolutism than the Palace of Versailles, which is still in existence today. Um, it's located a few miles outside of Paris in France. And if you are ever in Paris, it is one of the things you absolutely have to see. It is a monument to absolute power and absolute authority. The amount of authority that Louis XIV and his successors would wield over France, really until the French Revolution in the late 18th century, is incomprehensible to us today. His, his famous quote, um, which summarizes absolutism, is, I am the state. And Louis XIV was the state. This relates to our, our cult of personality here. Louis had a few other things going for him. This is a, a really good time for, for France economically. Um, France is going to be expanding its power base. Um, they're going to have a favorable balance of trade. This is the time when France is beginning to enter into the race for colonies. It's going to start to colonize um, North America, Canada, Canada. 
Um, so France is really expanding its power base, leading to an acquisition of gold. We should also note, however, that this is a time where France is pretty much constantly at, at war. More than half of the years Louis is in power, um, he is trying to expand um, his authority really into uh, present day Belgium, the Netherlands, um, at the time, the Holy Roman Empire, um, uh, colonial wars um, as well under Louis XIV. The Palace of Versailles. I mean, you think about what the Palace of Versailles represents. The Palace of Versailles represents the authority that Louis the Fourteenth and his successors, Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth, will have. Um, if you can imagine yourself being a foreign dignitary who is brought to the Palace of Versailles, this most incredible place, you would believe that Louis the Fourteenth was in fact ordained by God. Um, the Palace of Versailles was begun by. Um, Louis Thirteenth. It started out as a hunting lodge, um, and it is just continually expanded by Louis the Fourteenth, the Fifteenth, and the Sixteenth. It's actually a series of palaces. Um, this is going to legitimize Louis's rule in the eyes of other European rulers, but it's also going to glorify France. Um, there's there's pride that the French take in the Palace of Versailles, which is kind of a strange concept for us. Why would these peasants who are scraping a living take pride in the opulent and extravagant lifestyle of their ruler. Um, but we do this today. We take pride in our, our nation in the United States, even in things that we do not ourselves benefit from. Um, and this is just a part of patriotism, of pride in one's country. And so the French people see Louis XIV and his successors as glorifying France, as creating this um, incredible French um, political structure, but also culture and society. So I spent a lot of time talking about France because I do think that France is the model for absolutism, but um, there are some other political developments that we have to talk about here. So the decline of Spanish power, Spain has um, reached its, its apogee and is um, declining throughout the 17th century. There's a number of factors that lead to this the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, 1589, at the hands of the, the English. Um, they've overstretched their empire. The Spanish empire is really difficult to govern, and it's really expensive. There's competition for uh, from other powers like the French, but um, th there's also competition on the economic front um, from powers like the Dutch, who we'll talk about in a moment. So um, you couple this with dynastic stagnation and constant warfare, and the Spanish are, are just really chipped away at. So the, the height of Spanish power we can think of as the 16th century. By the 17th century, the Spanish are getting passed by. Um, Russian absolutism during the 17th and 18th century is actually um, rising in power. Russia is um, very powerful in terms of their land. Russia is becoming more powerful in terms of their political exertions. Peter the Great, who is, is pictured here, is another one of our model absolute rulers. We'll be taking a close look at Peter in class. Um, Peter is most known for attempting to westernize Russia. We talked about in Unit 2 how Russia straddles Europe and Asia, and Russia has always had this split personality for that reason. Um, it's got the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's got a very distinct um, language, very distinct history and culture and customs. Um, Peter's, Peter looks at um, Western Europe and he travels extensively in Western Europe and he says, if we want to be powerful, we have to model ourselves on Western Europe. Peter and his successors are always going to be obsessed with um, gaining access to a warm water port, gaining access to the Mediterranean Ocean trade. Despite their huge land-based empire, Russia feels that they are missing out on the fruits of overseas expansion on um uh, American expansion on um, overseas trade. And so Peter is going to set about westernizing Russia. Famously, he um, goes around cutting off the, the nobles' very long Russian beards. You can see he is pictured here in one of his state portraits without um, a beard. Russia, um, excuse me, Peter the Great is um, very interested in westernizing Russia, as is um, his, uh, his wife, who takes over for him um, after he dies, Catherine the Great. Two um, excellent examples of absolute rulers. Um, Prussia is also beginning to consolidate its power. Um, the German states, as we know, are um, 
not centralized at all, very decentralized under the Holy Roman Emperor. Prussia is one of these Russians, uh, excuse me, German states that's going to rise to prominence, um, especially in the 18th century. Frederick William and his grandson, Frederick William I, consolidate their power over the Junkers, the landowners. Um, uh, you can think of them as the German nobles. Um, they're going to build a very powerful standing army in a highly militaristic country. This is what Prussia is going to be known for. Prussia, eventually, when we get to the late 19th century, is going to unify Germany under its flag, but we are not there yet. Prussia is just one of many German states in the 18th century, but um, I think it bears pointing out because the the roots of Prussian military control over the rest of Germany are, are here in the 18th century with Frederick William and Frederick William I. Mention the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is an Islamic empire. Its, it's um, power base is in the Middle East. But if we were to go to the 17th century um, in Europe, there'd be a lot of talk about the Ottoman Empire. And that's because the Ottoman Empire has stretched its borders all the way into Austria. They're knocking on the door of Vienna by the time we get to the mid 17th century. This is going to be the height of Ottoman territorial control in, um, in, in Europe, really, the height of Ottoman territorial control period, but in Europe as well. The Ottomans represent an existential threat for Europeans. And we saw that in the Darwin reading that we did in unit two, the Ottomans represent a strong push factor for Western Europe to go out into the oceans and try to cut them out of trade. Um, yeah, it, it bears mentioning that the Ottomans are um, in a lot of Europe. I mean, they control Greece and they control uh, modern day Romania. They're knocking on the doors of Italy um, and Austria. So um, that's, that's the Ottomans. And then um, a, a real difference, which we're going to talk about um, in a moment that I wanted to, to mention here is the Dutch Republic. The Dutch reject monarchy. The Dutch states hold power, the most powerful of the Dutch states, Holland, and they build their power base off of their merchant fleet. They have the largest merchant fleet in Europe in the mid 17th century. And this means really low shipping rates. The Dutch are able to undercut a lot of their other European competitors. Um, and it leads to a very powerful trading state, small in land area, but very powerful in terms of economic control. Um, over trade. Also, the Dutch are known for religious toleration. Um, when the Huguenots are expelled from France, for example, they flee to the Netherlands. Um, they also tolerate, to some extent, um, the Jews, which we saw from our study of the Reformation. The Jews are a persecuted minority really all across Europe. Persecuted in the Netherlands, too. We don't want to overstate the extent of um, religious toleration, but the Jews enjoy more religious toleration in the Netherlands than many other places in Europe. So that's like a snapshot of the political situation of Europe with one glaring exception, and that is England. Um, I separate England out in this PowerPoint because whew, um, <laughs> there's a lot of developments going on in England during this time period, and the College Board wants you to know them fairly well. It's very easy for us to get lost in English history, and I'm going to attempt to not get too far into the weeds here for two reasons. One, um, I don't know this stuff very well, to be quite honest with you. Uh, my English history is um, not up to par. Um, I'm an Americanist first and foremost, but also because I really don't think you need the minutia um, that you used to need for English politics in AP Euro, even if we go back five years ago, they used to, College Board used to really put a lot of emphasis on knowing the different English families and ruling families and um, monarchs and family trees. And man, you can really get lost in that stuff. There's a lot of interesting things in there. There's a lot of palace intrigue and nepotism and uh, all that stuff. So if you want to if you want to dive into that, feel free, but I am going to try to streamline this and give you what I think is the most important information. So um, here we go. So uh, Elizabeth I, um, we start here in the late 16th century. 
exercised great personal power. So she's um, following after Henry VIII, one of the most powerful English monarchs. Remember, Henry VIII is the one who has the six wives and who creates the Church of England with him as the head of the Church of England. So after that, we get Elizabeth I, the Elizabethan age. Um, the victory over the Spanish Armada in 1588 is one of these these turning points in English history. It's a turning point because the English begin to believe that they are ordained by God to, this is a divine act that the Spanish Armada is defeated. The Spanish Armada had no business defeating, uh, being defeated by the English fleet, the English fleet, much smaller, much less powerful, but the Spanish Armada is destroyed by, um, by storms. And this is seen as a divine intervention. This is seen as proof that God is protecting the English islands. Uh, and this blesses Elizabeth's reign. It's Elizabethan time period. This is the time of Shakespeare. I mean, it's really a, a, a great time for the rise of English cultural authority in the late 16th and um, 17th centuries. I don't want to overstate it here, um, but if we're looking backwards we can see that this is the beginning of the rise of English authority over European society and culture. Now we're not we're not there yet. It's really going to take us until like the 19th century, quite honestly, until we see that. But um, the roots are there. So her sole weakness: succession. And when she dies, there is a crisis of succession, which leads to the ascension of James the Sixth from Scotland. He is the monarch of Scotland and he will be crowned James I of England. So he is James VI of Scotland. When he succeeds to the throne of England, he becomes James I. So that's why you see it as two different titles. So he's the cousin of Elizabeth I. He is very well educated. He is monarch for a very long time. He had ruled Scotland for, um, I think, close to 20 years before he becomes the ruler of England, and he's going to rule England for another 20 to, to 30 years, somewhere around there. Um, he believes in the divine right of kings, and he is going to work to, to make this legitimate in England. He is a prolific writer, um, and he is a, a brilliant legal and political mind, and so he is going to um, ensconce this um, power of the English monarchy. There's a problem here, though, and um, that is religion. So Henry VIII creates the Anglican Church, the Church of England, but um, a lot of um, the British Isles are still Catholic, Ireland, Scotland, and England. And so James is actually born Catholic, but he is raised Presbyterian. Um, the Presbyterians have a very um, strong power base up in Scotland, and when he rises to the throne of England, he takes over the Anglican Church. He's the head of the Anglican Church. So we have a lot of religious tension here. There's a lot of distrust of James because he's born Catholic, so is he Catholic? Um, he's raised Presbyterian. He's Scottish, so is he Presbyterian? Like, where are his allegiances? So because of this, we have a lot of tension in England. The most famous representation of this is the Gunpowder Plot, 1604, 1605. Guy Fawkes and his followers attempt to blow up the houses of Parliament. Fox himself is Catholic, so this is an, a Catholic attempt to blow up Parliament, which is foiled. Guy Fawkes Day is celebrated in England today as the um, a day where the the, the um, Protestant throne is protected. This plot is um, foiled. Um, in the early 17th century. So a lot of um, religious tension here, okay? So we need to know that. Um, there's also political tension, um, and that is tension between the English monarch and parliament. And this is tension that has existed for a long time. You can go back to the Magna Carta in 1215. Who rules England? What authority do the people, air quotes around that, basically the nobility, the landowning classes, what authority do they have over England? Well, we get this guy, Charles I, who's going to take over after James I. He attempts to govern without Parliament. However, that does not go well. <laughs> he needs to call Parliament in 1640 um, to raise taxes and to solve some pretty ex um, extreme political issues that exist. Um, he calls Parliament. There's this thing called the Short Parliament, where Parliament only um, uh, is called for uh, 11 weeks and then they disband. They're called back, and um, the long parliament 
is parliament that ceases to exist. We, um, sorry, ceases, um, my brain is going in five different directions. They cease to desist. Parliaments used to be only called when they were needed. We think of parliaments today as being these legislative bodies that are in session pretty much in perpetuity. That is not the case. If we were to go back to 17th century Europe, these parliamentary bodies were only called in times of emergency or in times of great need. When the parliament is called, Charles I basically says to them, hey, solve these problems and then go away, disband. Parliament refuses to disband. And so this leads to the long parliament from 1640 to 1660. And this is a big deal because the long parliament is going to kill Charles I and take authority for themselves. So we have a rebellion that begins in Ireland in 1641, the oldest of the um, English colonies. And Parliament is unwilling to grant Charles the funds to solve the um, rebellion. And this leads to the English Civil War. There are a whole host of other problems that are going on in England at the time. We're not going to get into them. I don't know them very well, but they're the classic problems. Um, religious divisions, the peasants are struggling, who has the authority, parliament or the king, etc., etc. So both sides raise armies, the roundheads versus the cavaliers, and Oliver Cromwell rises to um, lead the parliamentary army, his new model army, which is actually going to become so powerful that it takes control of England from 1649 until 1660. Charles I is killed. He is tried for treason and executed in 1649. And Cromwell is going to declare a republic in England. But for all intents and purposes, Cromwell is going to rule as a dictator. And so the question here is, where does power lie? Who has power? And for a time in England, the answer is unequivocally parliament, because the king is killed and the monarchy is dissolved. What happens is Oliver Cromwell dies in 1658, and there is a political crisis. There is no clear line of succession. This is one of the benefits of monarchy, is that there is almost always a line of succession. There is a um, peaceful transfer of power because it is um, very clear in the blood of the kings and the queens and their descendants. Well, republics don't have this benefit, and so when Cromwell dies, there is a struggle over authority. And eventually Parliament says, hey, you know what we should do? We should go back to monarchy. Um, why did we ever get rid of that in the first place? Um, so Charles II, who is the oldest surviving son of Charles I, is invited to reign. Parliament is restored. Remember, security versus freedom. For a time, freedom sounds pretty good. Let's kill the king. Let's take control for ourselves. But heavy is the head that wears the crown. And so Parliament doesn't want to deal with these problems anymore, doesn't know how to deal with these problems anymore. Time to bring back the king. And for a time, there's actually a really good relationship between the monarchy and um, the landowning classes, the nobles and Parliament. Then Charles dies and James II takes over. There's some problems with James II, the biggest being that he is openly Catholic. Um, by this point, England has had a Protestant church as its, um, as its church, the Anglican church, for over 100 years, and there is a lot of mistrust um, of James II. He has a son, and so now the question is, are we looking at a Catholic dynasty? And so James II's reign is very short, and this leads to one of the most important developments in English history, which is the Glorious Revolution. Um, so James II is removed from power in 1688. And what we have here is the destruction of this idea of the divine right of kings once and for all. Now, there is still going to be a monarchy here. Um, William and Mary are invited to rule. They had been living in the Netherlands. Mary is the daughter of James II, but she had married William of Orange, who is a Protestant. And so they are Protestant um, rulers. They are going to be invited by Parliament to rule in conjunction with Parliament. And so sovereignty in England is going to be equally divided between the monarchy and the parliament. This is 
a huge deal, the sharing of powers. The Bill of Rights, which is passed in 1689, is still the cornerstone of the British Constitution today. Laws are to be made by parliaments. They cannot be suspended by the crown. Parliament meets regularly. It meets three times a year. It is not just something that is called in times of crisis. Excuse me. There is a judiciary that has independence and citizens are granted some rights. When we talk about citizens, remember, put ourselves in the 17th century. We're pretty much just talking about the wealthy landowning classes, So, and certainly men. We don't want to overstate things here. And also when we talk about rights, we're talking about um, political rights. Um, we're talking, we're, we're, we're not really talking yet about rights as we view them in 21st century America, so we don't want to overstate it. Um, but this is incredibly significant because it's going to lead to stability. It's going to lead to a form of government in England that um, allows England to, to thrive and prosper throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And so this is the Glorious Revolution. Like I said at the start of this guided lecture, I think we're missing a key component of this, which is the early Enlightenment, although the Enlightenment is kind of like 18th century. But people like John Locke are going to carve out a place intellectually for where the Glorious Revolution can, can actually happen. So that's the history of, um, of English political authority throughout the 17th century. And um, I hope it, it makes sense to you. Like I said, I am far from an expert on it. So um, if you have any questions, I'll, um, I'll attempt to answer them. But uh, the old Google machine might be a good place for you to turn as well. All right, almost done here. I know this guided lecture is oh, it's dragging on, as the AP Euro guided lectures can do. Um, just two more slides left. Um, the market economy and the agricultural revolution. So College Board shoehorns in some economic stuff to the end of all this political stuff in Unit 3. So um, so let's talk about it. So agricultural revolution, we're talking about the agricultural revolution in Britain, not the Neolithic, <laughs> Neolithic revolution that happens um, 14,000 years ago. Um, this is the unprecedented growth in agricultural production. Uh, we're talking like mid-17th century when we're talking about the agricultural revolution. As with a lot of these things, guys, I would caution you against viewing this as a singular event. The agricultural revolution, much like the industrial revolution, is actually just going to be this um, drawn-out process. But um, it's, it's much more compact. Um, so I say drawn out, it happens over a couple hundred years. But in the long history of humanity, that's pretty compact. And so, yeah, the agricultural revolution, we don't want to see it as this thing where all of a sudden one year people are like, oh, we should revolutionize our agriculture. And I think you know that, but um, just, just pointing it out. So causes, probably the biggest cause is the idea of crop rotation. Um, crop rotation really takes hold throughout England um, and it allows for the ground to be much more fertile crop rotation when it's done correctly allows for three growing seasons instead of just two. So this is going to increase the food supply crop rotation. It, it injects vital nutrients into the soil. When you just grow the same crop over and over and over again, it's going to suck out the nutrients that that crop needs. But when you rotate um, crops and when you rotate fields, um, this is really going to allow um, agricultural production to increase substantially. Um, this is also related to the development of national markets. National markets in Britain, but national markets all across Europe. Um, improved transportation structures, early proto-industrial revolution, um, the building of canals, the building of roads, um, things like that. And we have to, of course, mention the Columbian Exchange. Um, the Columbian Exchange has been going on for you know, over 100 years, 150 years. And so because of that, the European countries are starting to feel the positive effects of that. We have different crops to go, to grow. We have um, imported goods that are coming from the Americas. And we have a free labor supply in, in slavery. The horrors of slavery is really taking off in the mid-17th century as well. Britain is going to start to use their colonies to become incredibly wealthy. And so this definitely relates to the agricultural production in Britain taking off. So why does this matter? Well, the population rises substantially in 1700 to 1900. If you were to chart the population of Europe, 
um, between, oh gosh, I don't know. You can go back to like the first century and all the way up to the 17th century, population pretty much re remains stagnant. Um, there are periods where it goes up, but then there are periods where it goes down. It's basically a flat line for 1700 years. All of a sudden, we get to the mid 17th century and that line starts to go up and it has been going up ever since. Now, all of a sudden, Britain can support a larger population than it ever could. Um, and so population is the bedrock of power for a country. And so this is going to connect directly to the Industrial Revolution. It's going to lead to the rise of urbanization and the rise of um, cities and the factory model. We're not there yet, but you need um, a working class. You need a very large, very healthy well-fed working class in order for something like the Industrial Revolution to take place. And it also is going to relate to the Columbian Exchange and the Triangle Trade. They're, 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 all just, um, they're all just systems that are going to perpetuate themselves. And so that's why the Agricultural Revolution is such a, a big deal. Of course, it's going to spread to the continent and the rest of the world, but it, it begins in, in Britain. Last slide here. So um, we're talking about the market economy and the development of the market economy. This is proto-capitalism with the putting out system also referred to as the domestic system, um, which is where we have small workshops. We have textiles that are um, that are uh, pushed to these small workshops and then they are put out to market. So that's the, uh, the putting out system there. Eventually, the putting out system is just not going to be able to meet the demands of British trade and the British population as it grows. And so it's going to be um, replaced by the, the factory model. What we also see here is um, the development of the free market and um, its eventual replacement of mercantilism. Mercantilism is that theory that markets are highly state controlled, um, highly centralized, economic authority is centralized in the state, and that exports need to exceed imports, that the balance of trade always has to be favorable. Eventually, the free market is going to replace mercantilism. It's going to take a couple hundred years, but the Dutch Republic is what's going to model the powers of the free market as compared to mercantilism. And I don't want to overstate this. It's not like you go to the Netherlands in the, um, the early 17th or late 17th century, and it's just like, you know, laissez-faire free market capitalism. Not the case. Um, not the case. But compared to very tight mercantilist control that we see in other areas of Europe, we're approaching something like the, the free market and the decline of state control over trade. And so what we see is the development of capitalism in the late 18th century. Adam Smith famously writes The Wealth of Nations in 1776, this treatise that is arguing from a philosophical point, he is an economic philosopher, arguing from a philosophical point that laissez-faire capitalism and no government intervention is actually what's going to allow for not just people, but countries to thrive. Um, he talks about the invisible hand that guides the market. You don't need a visible government hand guiding the market. Governments should get out of the way. And if they do, people will act in their own economic interest and voila, you will have, um, you will have wealth. And wealth not just for the people, but for the states as well. And related to this, we get the development of, of a consumer culture as there are more goods that are available, as more goods are put to market, people are buying more things than they are producing. Uh, and so this is the development of a consumer culture. There's a lot of roots here in this unit. You know, there's, this is why it's called the early modern era in European history, because the, the roots are modernity. You know, we are feeding into modernity, but we are not there yet. Um, so that's the early modern era in, um, in Europe. So, okay, I will stop talking because you are tired of hearing it. And that's it for the Unit 3 Guided Lecture.